Okay, so um, we had left off last time talking about the taxation of gifts, and let's just uh, summarize briefly the, the, uh, some of the main points that we, we made. Uh, the first thing we learned is that under section 102A of the code, uh, the value of a gift, whether in money or property, is excluded from gross income. Now, I, I want to emphasize again that the issue of the taxation of gifts that we study is completely separate and distinct from another issue involving the gift tax, and particularly whether the transferor, the party making the gift, has any tax liability under the gift tax. Um, under the gift tax, certain transferors are going to have gift tax liability because they're essentially giving some of their wealth away. But that whole tax system and the law there and all of the definitions and so forth are completely separate and distinct from the issue that we focus on. What we're focusing is not on taxing the transferor, but whether the transferee, the recipient of this purported gift, has any income tax liability as a result of that. And what we've now learned from Section 102A is that in general, the donee does not have any income tax liability. The value of the gift is not excluded, uh, not included in income. So importantly, the fact that under the gift tax laws, there is an exemption, which I've kind of lost track of exactly how much it is, but it's roughly around $13,000 a year, which allows a transferor to avoid paying any gift tax for moderate to small size gifts per year per do donee. The fact that that is in the law has no relevance for our course. And if you cite to that rule in the final exam, that would be a mistake. And you will probably lose a little bit of credit for that, okay? Okay, second thing we learned is what exactly then is the meaning of gift. And here we, we read the Duberstein case and we learned from uh, the majority in Duberstein that the way we determine whether a transfer is a gift is based on the transferor's objective intent. And what has to be shown for a transfer to be a gift is the detached or disinterested generosity on the part of the transferor. And this, of course, is necessarily a factual determination to be made by the fact finder. And the fact finder is to apply the mainsprings of human conduct to make that determination, whatever that is, okay? All right, third, we talked a little bit about why the law allows gifts to be excluded from income. And here, we focused on the notion that consumption, uh, if thought of in a preclusive sense, and, and consumption is, of course, an element of income, if we think of consumption in the preclusive sense, meaning that what I consume, you cannot, and what you consume, I cannot, then we said, if we look at a transfer, a gift uh, transaction, what we seem to see is we see the transferor losing the ability to consume by essentially giving some benefit to the transferee, who in turn gains the ability to consume. And so if we think then again of consumption in this preclusive sense, we might conclude that the transferor has lost or should have been reduced the amount of income that the transferor has, and in turn the transferee has increased the amount of his or her income by the increase in the amount of consumption benefits gained. That in turn means that if in making the gift we deny the transferor a deduction, in effect taxing the transferor an income, even though the transferor has lost this consumption benefit, 
that might be a reason or a rationale to say, well then in turn, when we look at the transferee who has obtained this consumption benefit, maybe it would be all right to not tax that consumption benefit to the transferee. So if we take both parties into the picture, we might, be, uh, we might have a rationale for failing to tax the transferee on the benefit being obtained. Another way of saying it is, because we're overtaxing the transfer, arguably, we perhaps have a rationale for undertaxing the transferee. Now we didn't go the further step, which we will go to in just a moment, which is, well, why would the law want to do that? Uh, I mentioned that this is an example of proxy or surrogate taxation, where the law essentially is taxing one person in lieu of another person, right? So we're imposing taxes on somebody even though they really, or at least in theory, should belong to somebody else. And the question is, well, why would the law want to do that? And that's something we're going to touch on in just a second. Okay, we also uh, learned uh, from the Duberstein case that two arguments, two so-called bright line arguments that the government raised with the court were rejected by the court. So the government argued first that the term gifts should be limited to transfers in a personal context, which in both Duberstein and Stanton was not present, or at least arguably was not present according to the government. And second, uh, the bright line test was that if a transfer is deducted by the payor, then it cannot be treated as a gift to the payee. And this, this bright line test was particularly pertinent to the Duberstein case because as you call Mr. Berman, the transferor had in fact deducted uh, the automobile given to Duberstein. Well, the government raised both of these arguments and urged the court to accept these arguments as part of the law. And the court quite understandably said, well, they, they sound like good rules, but we don't know if they are appropriate in all cases. And in any event, we're not a legislature, and so we're just not going to go in that direction. Finally, we learned that in fact the legislature after Duberstein came into the picture and enacted Section 274B. And what 274B says is that if a transfer is a gift for purposes of Section 102, then essentially the transferor cannot deduct that transfer, okay, with a very little de minimis exception to that, okay? And it's not precisely the same as the second bright line test that the government urged in Duberstein, but that in fact it is a logical equivalent to that test. Okay? All right, so at the very end of the hour then we were evaluating kind of the state of current law. Uh, and in particular, the existence now of Section 274B as well as Section 102A. And we were trying to figure out whether uh, what we thought about the state of current law. And there were two thoughts that, that uh, we raised at the very end of the hour. One is that you notice current law still requires the identification of a transfer as a gift or not. That is, if you apply Section 274, or indeed if you apply Section 102, each rule is operative only if there's a gift in the picture, right? And we know further that gift, in turn, is a hard concept to define, right? It requ requires, as the court uh, has indicated, this factual determination based on the objective intention of the transferor. Now, Bear in mind, you encounter many legal issues that require some kind of a factual determination. So the fact that we have to make one in this particular case, there's nothing particularly surprising or unique in that. But one thing to remember, and I've you know, kind of tried to stress this throughout the semester so far, is that in the tax system, much of the determination of the law and the outcome of the law is made unilaterally by taxpayers on their own. That is, in the vast majority of cases, the tax 
taxpayer makes the determination, what is income, what is not, how much tax do I pay on whatever income I believe I have, that's the end of the inquiry. There's no review. There's no check, right? There's no higher authority that's coming in that is examining the claim by the taxpayer and saying, guess what? You misunderstood the law, okay? So what that means then is that we want the law as best as possible, at least for well-intended, well-meaning taxpayers, we'd like the law to provide as much bright line guidance to taxpayers so that a well-intended taxpayer can simply then easily understand what the rule is and apply it to his or her own circumstance. Because at the end of the day, that is the law, at least as it's going to be implied in, applied in the vast majority of circumstances. And in that context, then, the notion of relying upon this fact finder determination of whether a gift, uh, a transfer is a gift or not based on this objective intent is potentially a little problematic. At least it's not ideal from the standpoint of, uh, of having the tax law. So one problem is that we still have to rely or make this determination of what a transfers qualify as a gift. And the second problem I mentioned was what? Was that the two parties in the transaction are independent parties. That is, the law here is tying these two elements of the transaction together. It's saying if it's excluded from income under Section 102, then it's not deductible by the payor. So the law is now locking these two issues together, or trying to, right? The problem, though, is that the law doesn't lock the two parties together, right? The two parties are independent of one another. And therefore, at the end of the day, even if it turns out to be the case that the payee is going to exclude a particular item of income as a gift under Section 102, and even though the law says the payor cannot deduct a gift to the payee, right? The law doesn't prevent the payor from coming in and having his or her day in court. And he or she can argue, you goofed in treating the payment to the payee as a gift. It wasn't a gift. And therefore, the law does not deny me the ability to deduct this item. Uh, this is a notion of whipsaw. This whipsaw arises all, all the time in the tax system where the two parties to a transaction essentially opposite uh, argue in inconsistent ways, but consistent from the standpoint of their you know, individual objectives, perfectly consistent, but in the larger scheme of things, they're arguing in an inconsistent way, okay? All right, so finally we come then to the end of handout number six. I ask you to take a look at a possible reform to the law to see if we would prefer um, uh, the change that I've outlined at the end there. Uh, and what the reform would say is that in determining the tax consequences of a payment, uh, the parties must make a joint election to either do either one of two things. Either they agree that the payor can deduct the payment, in which case the payee then uh, must include the payment in income, or they agree that the payor cannot deduct the payment, in which case the payee is allowed to exclude the item from income. Okay? All right, so let's look at this kind of choice that's available now to think about it a little bit. First thing to notice is that the choice is trying to provide an internally consistent answer to this uh, 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 potentially difficult question. And what do I mean by that? Well, you notice that each choice necessarily preserves some taxation of this benefit. Right? In the first case, if we allow the payor to deduct the payment, thereby pulling the benefit out of the payor's tax base and not taxing the payor, 
we necessarily require the item to be included in the tax base of the payee. So the payee is going to pay tax on the benefit. Second case is just the opposite, where we allow the amount to be excluded from the payee's tax base, but only on condition that the payor gets no deduction and therefore the amount remains in the payor's tax base. So the first thing to notice that is the rule that is being proposed here is internally consistent in terms of achieving this objective. Second thing to notice is that the rule doesn't turn on the existence of a gift, right? It's now simply talking about any transfer between two parties, whether a gift or not. And of course, that potentially has an advantage because then that cuts out the need to make this determination of, ah, what exactly <laughs> was the objective intention of the transfer when the transfer was made. Okay? All right, and then the last point is, of course, what the rule tries to do is to lock not only the two issues together, but the two parties together. And the way, as a practical matter, it would be done is it would require the parties who want to get one of these choices to file appropriate pieces of paper with their signature, essentially agreeing to go along with this, right? And so it's locking those two together. Having now locked them together, they have essentially surrendered their ability to turn around later and say, oh, guess what? I don't agree with this piece of paper that I signed, right? I'm going to take a tax position contrary to that. Obviously, they can do that, but the hurdle now is going to be much harder for them to succeed at that than under existing law where there is no such joint election being made, okay? Okay, so let me ask, um, let's see, uh, how about Alexander Debris? Yes, so Alexander, what do you think about this reform? Do you see any particular problems with it? They might not want to share information like that with each other. Okay, that's actually a very interesting point. So where have we seen that already? Where have we already talked just briefly, very quickly, about the notion that in certain cases, we require people to file in a joint manner, but we open up a little window of an exception because we understand that in some cases it might be hard to make a joint election. Remember? How about uh, um, Kian D'Souza? Kahan. Kahan, yes. Um, and so I'm not sure. Are you responding to Alex's concern? He said that the parties might not be willing to share. What are you talking about now? Well, um, I think that when we discuss employees um, and employer relationships, that in that case you would have to ask your employee to give you information so that you could declare certain. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. So we did, and uh, yes, so we did talk a little bit about the concept of withholding and information reporting and so forth. Right. Um, uh, and so that certainly is a, a, an issue involving a sharing relationship. But what about in terms of a tax filing? What, what circumstance have we, yes? Um, when allowing married individuals to file separately? Yeah. Yes, exactly right. So as a general proposition, married couples have an option to file jointly. And as I indicated when we talked about this a little bit, in virtually all cases, it is in their collective interest to do so. That is, they can reduce the amount of their tax liability when they do so. And yet the law opens up a little window to say, but if you choose not to do so, you can file in this alternative arrangement where you're a married couple filing separately or not. 
And I said, well, why would the law provide that if, in fact, in almost all cases, that would be a poor choice for a couple to make? And the answer is that in certain circumstances, it may be difficult to file with, for example, an estranged spouse, that kind of a situation. Okay, so we could certainly think of the same scenario here, we, where we could think of, for some reason, the two parties in the transaction had become estranged in some way, and therefore getting them to sign this joint piece of paper might, in fact, be, as a practical matter, difficult. Okay, we can certainly think of that scenario. That's a legi legitimate concern. Now, from the reformer's standpoint, the reformer would say, well, okay, that's okay. This is simply the default rule, okay? If you can do what the default rule allows you to do, then you get this result, okay? If for whatever reason you can't do that, you can't find the other person, you don't get along with the other person, for whatever reason you can't make a joint election, then you don't get the benefit of this rule, right? And therefore, the tax consequences simply fall back on whatever the law is in the absence of the rule, that is current law, okay? So if you think of the reform as trying to kind of cut through some of the uncertainty of current law, you could say, okay, probably the majority of the people probably could do this, and if they were to do that, then they would get at least that simplification benefit. And in the absence of making the election, okay, you're no worse off than we are today, okay? So I would think that would be an answer or a partial answer, although again, I think it's a perfectly good uh, 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 argument or concern to be raised. What else? What would be another possible objection to this? Yeah, David. It kind of takes the fun out of gift giving takes the what? <laughs> okay, so that's interesting too, right? And um, I guess, you know, this is kind of in a different world maybe uh, where, where, where people don't think, uh, they don't want to think about these kind of real world considerations like taxes, right? And so, so perhaps that would be an issue. Yes, sir? Uh, well, anytime you tax something, you discourage it might say, don't gifts sort of encourage the redistribution of wealth? And don't we want to encourage that? Okay, so you're making kind of a different point, which is to say, well, we would like to encourage as a policy matter the making of gifts, and therefore what? And therefore, in a sense, we want the tax outcome of a gift to actually be better than the tax outcome that isn't a gift, right? And that, you know, there may be a point to be made there. I can't, I can't disregard that. We haven't learned anything in the law so far that would necessarily suggest that that's what the law is doing, right? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Isn't this pretty much um, not enforced? I really, I, the IRS doesn't cause a huge ruckus during Christmas. And usually the wealthier parties and families end up giving much more expensive gifts, uh, you know, the younger people. And when you say it's not enforced, I don't understand what you so mean it's by not. Basically, debt letter law. Um, from what I understand, unless other than when cases like this where someone actually claims it on their tax. And I don't understand what you mean by debt letter law. So if there's a if there's a large gift at the end of the year and the payee doesn't report it in income, and the payor doesn't deduct it, what is it exactly that the IRS now is supposed to be doing? Is that an example of dead letter law? Or is that an example of exactly complying with the law that is the law? The law isn't dead, the law is telling you that outcome. And if parties, in fact, report in accordance with that outcome, then I don't know why there's a problem if the IRS doesn't do anything. Okay, let's, let's come back and think about what might be an objection here, and let me ask it in the context of the following. Think of the Stanton case, okay? Suppose you're involved in advising one or either or both of the parties in the Stanton case and this reform is available to you. 
do you elect the, do you counsel the parties to elect the reform? And if you do counsel the parties to elect the reform, which option do you choose? Yes, ma'am. Okay, exactly right. And how would that then play out in the Stanton case? Um, if the church isn't paying taxes, then it would make sense for them to, I suppose, give the gift to the transferee, and he doesn't have to afford that. Okay, and which choice then would you be counseling the parties to make here? Single I or double I? Um, double I. Double I. So you're going to disallow the deduction to the church and why does that is that advantageous because they're not paying any taxes right and in fact I think it was a subsidiary of the church that was involved in Stanton and so we don't know for sure but if we assume that the payor in Stanton was a tax exempt organization of which there are such organizations tax exempt meaning an organization that pays a zero tax on any amount of income that that organization may have. And we'll talk a little later in the semester about uh, uh, the taxation of tax-exempt organizations and some of the exceptions that apply. Um, then disallowing a deduction to that taxpayer doesn't do anything or, or create any particular harm in terms of the tax consequences of the transaction. And the benefit of choice number two is that the item is then excluded from the income of the payee. Okay? Now, that gives you a little bit of an indication, perhaps, of why current law imposes this surrogate or proxy taxation notion. Remember, what current law arguably does is it overtaxes the donor in exchange for undertaxing the donee, okay? But of course, if you think about what's happening in a gift situation, typically which party isn't going to be what, would, what you would expect to be in the higher bracket? Would you think it's the donor or the donee, typically? Rachel? The donor. The donor, sure. Right? The party that's making the gift likely has a greater amount of wealth than the donee and therefore likely has a greater amount of income than the donee. Obviously it doesn't have to be the case, but perhaps on balance it's likely to be the case. And if that's true, then what current law does is current law overtaxes the party that's in the higher tax bracket and thereby undertaxes the party that's in the lower tax bracket. Okay. All right, what other uh, uh, thought or objection might arise here? Let me give you an example. Let's suppose that in the, uh, that Mr. Berman, instead of making a, transferring a Cadillac to Mr. Duberstein, is transferring, oh, let's say $500 in cash <laughs> to his um, long and trusted housekeeper at the end of the year. Okay, so that's the transfer now. And now again, we're evaluating that transaction in conjunction with this reform, or proposed reform. Okay, so Berman writes out a check or hands $500 in cash to his long and trusted housekeeper at the end of the year, right, with a big smile on his face. And the housekeeper has a big smile on his or her face as well. Okay? So what do you think of this rule? Does the rule work or not? What, is, what should be the tax treatment of that transaction? Think of it in terms of the consumption benefits being obtained, okay? So think about the housekeeper. The housekeeper is getting $500 in cash at the end of the day. Has he or she obtained any consumption benefits as a result of the transaction? Yes, in the back. Absolutely. Absolutely, sure. A person can go out and do anything they want to do with that money, right? Okay. So from standpoint of taxing that person, at least in theory, you would say, sure, there's a basis to tax that person on having received income. How about to Berman? 
Berman makes this $500 payment. What is Berman doing when Berman is making that $500 payment? What would you say? I would say he's giving a gift. He could be giving a gift, right? And he could also be doing something else. Paying a wage. He could be paying a wage, right? People have received bonuses all the time, right? At the end of the year. No reason why a housekeeper can't receive a nice bonus. And when you say it's a paying a wage, what exactly is Berman getting then for that $500? $500 worth of services. Exactly, right? Berman is getting a nice house, right? A well cared for house. That's what Berman has hired this housekeeper to do. Berman is getting consumption benefits from paying the housekeeper this, for this service that the housekeeper is providing to Berman. So what does that tell you? That tells you that certain transfers should be taxable to both parties, right? And that only maybe a category of transfers, let's call them gifts, should we only be taxing one of the parties, right? And of course, there are many instances where we're taxing both of the parties. So just think about tonight. You go home, and on your way home, you stop in the grocery store, and you buy $10 worth of groceries, right? Are you getting any consumption benefits out of that? For sure, right? What about the grocer who gets the $10? Is that person or that company getting any consumption benefits? Absolutely, right? And so if you think of a number of transfers in very common circumstances, you realize that this rule doesn't work. What this rule does is it says we're only going to tax one party or the other. But in certain kinds of transactions, we actually want to tax both parties. And so then now we have to distinguish between the kinds of situations where we only want to tax one and those where we want to tax both. Okay, anybody with a question on uh, gifts? Okay, very good. So let's turn then to the uh, next unit which uh, involves the issue of recovery of capital. And let me begin by just uh, starting with a, 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 a simple example. Um, let's suppose uh, let's suppose you own some um, some stock in a company that you purchased uh, previously. Uh, over the last six to eight, ten months or so, the market has actually been doing pretty well. And let's assume that your stock, as well as a bunch of other stocks, have actually gone up in value somewhat. And now you're sitting here February of 2012 and you're kind of looking down the road and all you see are dark clouds down the road. You see all sorts of potential problems facing the country and the world and you're thinking, gee, you know, maybe I ought to get out of the market, right? Because the market is likely to fall. So you call up your broker and you say to your broker, please sell all of my shares in that company broker does so, and disregarding the broker's commission, broker then tells you, uh, yes, uh, we sold all your shares, uh, they were, you got $1,000, and we've transferred that into your bank account, okay? Now the question is, how much income, if any, do you have as a result of that transaction? Um, how about, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Jim, Jim Meow Do? Jimmy Do. Jimmy Do, okay. Uh, how much income is the uh, uh, cost of the shares you buy with that thing? Okay, very good. And why do you say that? Um, because if you achieve a, well, you think of a cost or something that uh, you can only be checked on the cost, and you recover. And so give us the instinct of that, because what I see is I see a thousand bucks going into your bank account. And so as a matter of enrichment, I see, gee, Jimmy here has a thousand dollars that he can consume any way that he wants, right? And therefore I see potential enrichment of a thousand dollars. And you would say? Um, I would say that... <coughs> <coughs> you, you had to pay a certain amount of money for the shares in the first place. So now, uh, not the entire $1,000. Okay, 
Okay, so you're saying that that isn't right. Not all $1,000 is income. So let me give you a, a rule and see if this is the rule you're trying to apply. Are you saying that the only time you have income is if the value of what you get exceeds the value of what you surrender? Only in that situation would we say you have any gain or income. That's what you would say. And so now I ask you just to turn to one of your classmates and ask, see if you can get any one of them to agree to a transaction with you where they provide you with an item, whether cash or property, whose value is greater than the value of what you will be transferring back to the classmate. Pick anybody. David over there, he's got a smile on his face. See if David will agree. David, do you agree? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so, okay. Well, David's a kind of a tough negotiator here. How about uh, um, Mike? Mike, Mike, you agree? Do. You agree to transfer to Jimmy there uh, a, a property or cash that is of greater value than what he's going to be transferring back to you? Value something is a somewhat subjective inquiry. So if I'm willing to accept the cash for it for less than its market value. That may be the case because I'm trying to get rid of the asset quick or something. Okay, so this is a complicated answer here we're getting here, right? And of course, life is complicated. We certainly don't want to dismiss that, right? But you notice that that rule doesn't sound like it's going to happen very much, right? A transfer where the two parties have agreed, where one party gets property or cash that is of greater value than the property or cash that's being surrendered. It doesn't sound like a transaction that's going to occur very often, right? And if that's the case, then that would seem to suggest that if in only those cases does a taxpayer have any income or gain, then in the vast majority of cases, perhaps, there is going to be no income or gain, right? Okay, so what then is the way that we would be looking at uh, these types of transactions here? Um, uh, it's important to understand that when we talk about income, we're not talking about gross receipts. So in my example, when you sold your shares for $1,000, your gross receipts were $1,000. You actually got $1,000 in bucks and they were actually transferred to your bank account, right? But that's not necessarily the test of what constitutes income, okay? Rather, and the second point is, we also don't compare the value of what is received from the value of what is surrendered. If that were the test again, in the vast majority of cases we think there would be no income, right? So what exactly then is income? And the income, the comparison for income is to compare the value of what is received over something known as the basis in the asset that is being surrendered. And this is set forth in uh, section 1001A and 1001B. What exactly does basis mean? Well, basis turns out to be a very important concept in the tax law. As an intuitive matter, you can think of basis much in the same way that Jimmy was uh, first expressing it, which is you can think of basis in general as representing the cost, or another way of thinking of it is the, the, the amount of your capital investment that is now being recovered when you receive it. So when you sell that stock for $1,000, your gross receipts is $1,000, but a portion of that $1,000 is merely a recovery of your capital investment, merely a recovery of your cost. And to the extent it is merely a recovery of your capital investment, it's not income. So we then need to determine, well then how much of that $1,000 is merely a recovery of capital investment or cost and how much is not. The tax system uses basis in a broader sense. So you can think of basis as measuring the amount of uh, income that has already been subject to tax. 
And when we use it in that concept, we commonly refer to it as tax paid basis, although that term will kind of vary with how, how often people will use it. Uh, that usage uh, dovetails with this notion of cost. So, for example, if uh, some time ago I bought, I say I earned some money and I paid some tax on it and now with a portion of my after-tax profits, uh, proceeds, I turned around and bought some stock for a certain amount, let's say $200, and it's now worth $1,000 and I sell it, right? Then we would say my income or gain is only $800 even though my gross proceeds is a thousand because the two hundred dollars is a return of my already taxed income right my two hundred dollar investment I had already paid tax on that and therefore I don't have to pay income tax again on it and that's the concept uh, of basis okay importantly the last point is that uh, where it's feasible, it's required to allocate your basis if you make an incomplete disposition of your property interest. So in the example of my stock, if I had told the broker, let's assume I owned 100 shares of this particular stock, if I had told the broker, sell 50 of the shares, keep 50, but sell just 50, then, I would, then the broker would need or I would need to allocate a portion of my basis in the hundred to just the portion that's sold, okay? And that allocation would typically be based on the relative fair market value of those interests at that time, although there would be other ways of carrying that out.